the time to go to bloody Alice um, on the Oxford College Park Run area where we've had the lockdown on lunch programs but also where we will put the slides that you can download it'll just mean that you perhaps don't have to go through and make notes as we're going through the slides um, so let's move on so uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself and um, my name is Suala Head I've been working for roughly 18 to 20 years now in marketing probably like everybody else I've evolved alongside you all in that we've had to do so much in digital as time goes on and um, learning as we go in terms of different software, different hardware that we use to integrate all of that. For around what the last eight years I've been teaching and supporting students um, for Oxford marketing and also some universities. We've got really involved in not only the teaching and supporting and the delivery of that but also um, course development and so on. Um, I just want to do sure. that. Yeah. Are you unable to hear? If a few of you could just let me know that you you can hear, just give me a wave if the sound is coming through, okay? Is there a problem with the sound? Is the sound okay? I see, yeah, it's a little bit quiet. a little bit louder that's a bit better yeah thank you okay, I'll, come, I'll come as close to the screen so apologies for the apologies for the close-up and um, so moving on what we want to look at today is how we improve customer experience and as we know customer experience is becoming at the forefront of all of us as businesses buying for attention and one of the the things that led us to this was a little study that we did last year around the idea of our attention spans as consumers is decreasing all of the time. We've got something like an eight second attention span now as consumers. I'm thinking about this from the point of view of comparing us to we've now uh, been overtaken by goldfish. So we did this just as an experiment for um, an article that we did on our blog a while ago, looking at me to begin with. Thinking of just as a general consumer, obviously I consume as many products and services as the next person. How we're all multi-screening now, I personally are running on two desktops, one through work. Um, I've got two laptops at home. I also use a tablet partly for me, partly for my son. We've got two smartphones and also we've got, I think we've got two Amazon Echoes now within the house. So all of those things we are turning to as consumers to potentially solve our problems, potentially look for products and services, potentially look to embark on the customer journey, those, use those devices to the brand touch point. So I also took a look at the mobile phone of mine and I've got 52 active apps. I've got four email accounts. I'm in 17 WhatsApp groups. I am connected to 1,713 people on seven social media accounts. And by my own efforts, I do my very best to try and keep that as conservative as possible can. That's before we even think about the day-to-day -day life. And the reason that I want to do this is not just to give you my life story, but to think these are your general consumers and your consumers are suffering from digital fatigue. Obviously, at the moment, the situation is slightly different in that we are all locked down. Um, depending on you might be working from home, you might be remote, but it is a fight for our customers' attention. So this is one of the reasons that is leading to a drive for increased customer experience, a drive for us as businesses to make sure that the customer experience is as smooth, is as seamless, is as integrated as possible, because that person is that digitally fatigued soul that I've just described on the last page, who is literally on their mobile phone with 52 apps open, who's got emails to answer all of the time. So we need to make sure that we can cut through that. We need to make sure we can punctuate that and get through there to get their attention, really. Um, and customers are more in control than ever before. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. So we've got those platforms. We've got social media with all of our own importance to sort of um, put it in, a, in one way. I'm thinking about the idea of how we can look towards thinking of how we can put our customers in control and also make them feel interactive within within the process, within the whole 
idea of them being involved, them, them driving, interactivity, having that two-way dialogue and so on. And we want to think about that idea of personalised service and customer engagement and apologies that that is not off there on the slide. And operational efficiency there, so thinking about why do we think Amazon have won out so much? Why do we think Amazon have grown so much in the last few years? One of the reasons for that is because it's so easy for us to do that process. So often what we will do on Amazon is we will buy it and then we will think, oh, I bought it, what am I doing? It's already coming, it's coming within the next hour. That is that idea of operational efficiency. Often it's also recommending what we've already bought and similar products and so on. And it is also often storing our payment details, making it as easy as possible for us and everything is integrated. Thinking about how we need to integrate all of our new complex data sources. Now we've got this running alongside the backdrop of increased concerns for GDPR, increased concerns for privacy, security. We're seeing this big debate happening at the moment with regards to download and the NHS Act and so on. So we need to think about how we pull like this together. And one of our challenges as marketers, I feel, is quite literally on a Monday morning, you can go in and you can stare at the amount of data that is there. You could look at the email results, you could be looking at your social media analytics, you could look at Facebook analytics and so on. What do you do with all of that? How do you pull all of that together? One of the things that students and clients will often say to us is the analytics here is telling us this one thing and then this is telling us something different. We don't want to duplicate, we don't want to research and analyse just for the sake of it. We want to feed it back into the top of our marketing plan and we want to make that meaningful. And also just being mindful of all of our customers, myself included, as illustrated by that slide, will be working across multiple devices. We will be working across multiple platforms. I actually challenged myself a couple of nights ago to see if I could watch a video about the phone and just looking at things, looking at how much various things cost, and looking if that act is still alive, how many times they've been married. I'm finding myself in Wikipedia and I've missed half of the film because we're half heartedly looking at our mobile phones, we're looking through laptops and so on. We need to catch those customers, we need to get them. So there's a really good. Um, there's a really good quote here from Seth Godin that I just wanted to bring out, that, that marketing is a contest for people's attention. And that The slide that we're going to show quite a bit throughout shows you that picture of people queuing for when we need new mobile phones. Yes, this still happens to a certain extent, but we have to think of the idea that we are now queuing for our customers' attention. So we need to grab their attention because they are that person that I described as me, the consumer, on that slide. Apologies if there's any clunks, but we've been having some problems with um, my computer mouse this morning. So if there's all of this opportunity, let's just get in the game. How do we get right in the middle of that? If we're spending so much time on there, why can't we just grab our, our customers and our consumers where they are? What we've got to think of is this level of digital fatigue. And if 60% of digital adverts are never viewed by actual humans, then the seven, seven and a half billion almost wasted on badly placed adverts in the last year alone. I'll see that that is dollars, but of course you can also see that that'll be a massive amount of money in pounds. So is multi-channel marketing leading us to cannibalize our own budget? Are we all over the place? Are we where our customers are? Are we intervening in the customer journey? Are we nudging them through that version process what can we do and we just wanted to through this lockdown and lunch session today discuss some of those ideas what we don't want to do is just open every door we need to get there be mindful of all of our, our resources and be realistic we need to understand our customers one of the things that we'll often talk about in classes is um ask students possibly right play around lunchtime and i'll often do this as an experiment with my clients is just ask them to think of a digital advert that we've seen this morning and often we can't think of one we can't recall and it, it's pretty certain that we've already been on the internet that day probably leaning over into our bed and getting our mobile phone before we need to properly wake up so we need to think about just how much our consumers have become banner blind how much we can filter out how much we become really clever at doing that and understanding what isn't relevant to us and then manage all of our brand touch points. All of these touch points that we've now got available to us as marketers, as businesses, are potentially 
thoughts or tools that you can use to understand this interview. They can get a, a representation, they can get an impression of you. So whether they are online, offline, and the customer is in control, they are driving that process. That customer is on 24-7, that customer is a global consumer who can go to anywhere for their shopping. We can find out in a couple of seconds how much something is, who will deliver it to us the quickest, and so on and so forth. They will be bouncing around. There isn't anything, I've got some friends and some family, there isn't anything that they can't find out on the internet. To put this into context, um, I've got a client who is a wedding dress provider in Cheshire and five, six years ago her main competition was maybe those in the Made. So what we need to do is make sure that we are managing right across all of those touch points. Now I mentioned resources just a second ago and this is key here. We want to make sure that we don't, as I've said, open every door just for the sake of it. If we can't manage it efficiently, if we can't embed it into the strategy of our marketing, we don't open the doors, we don't have the wearables, we don't have blogs, we don't have end media. This has got to be being mindful of what we've got. So how we start to do this is we capture as much as we can about our customer and about our market insights. And there's just some really basic ways that we can do that. Now I mentioned measurements at the start with regards to not just measuring for the sake of it. We want to be measuring our customers through primary web analytics and reports. I said this in last week's webinar, your customers are and will always be a moving target. Just think how much the world has changed in two months. That's a fairly dramatic kind of representation, but likewise, still things do still change fairly. Um, constantly, maybe at a slower pace, just think how many more people are vegan, how many more people are sugar free now, and so on. You may know your customers yesterday, you won't know them tomorrow. So we've got to keep analysing. We've got to keep not only taking those web analytics that will give us the, the quantitative data, we want to also see the qualitative data. The quant we can stir up forever, but it won't give us the why. We also need to combine that with some voice of the customer, some kind of techniques, some kinds of surveys that ask the customers why. Why are you bouncing out with your deliveries too much? Why aren't you coming to us? Oh, we see you as not in our not in our price range. We didn't know that you deliver. We didn't know that you could offer this support. We thought that you were only this type of process. We need to understand why we don't know what we don't know. You can, of course, also draw on secondary reports. So we want to go to the likes of Google Trends and Consumer Barometer and just general web analytics reports, which will let us know what people care about. And if you can access them, if you can afford them, any kind of off-com research reports. That will then allow us to start to build up that idea of knowing our customers. We've got to take a walk in their shoes. If I was your customer, you've got to understand that slide at the start that shows me as that goldfish. And how we can really effectively do this is by building up something that we call marketing personas. Now, this is a composite sketch of your ideal customer. So if you take your customer segment, this is looking at who they are. This is looking at everything about them. And you keep adding to that as they evolve. You keep adding to that as they change, as your competitors change. And we can use some really kind of traditional demography as well as analytics. We want to know how old they are. Are they male, female? What kind of household they live in? What their levels of education are? And then we can supplement that also with our digital. We really, really want to understand what they use our products and services for. Now, Think about this, not only what your product and service is, but also think about this as what is the actual problem that it solves. The gym may offer you bicycles, treadmills, the actual problem that it solves to some people is they want to socialise, they want to live longer from a vanity point of view, they want to look better, and so on. We have, to, have to, we have to really drill down and understand what is the problem at the heart of what our product and services solve because all purchases begin with a problem. Also, what kind of situations, attitudes and scenarios happen for those customers to come to you? you know, are you the emergency service that it, they come to because you break down, they break down at the side of the road? Are, are you the coffee that they grab just as they're about to get on a train or an aeroplane and so on? 
and then we can understand the customer journey and if we understand the customer journey then we can understand how those customers interact with all of those brand touch points start small and start to build up your personas Chaffee and Alice Chadwick write a lot on personas like as you know Dr Dave Chaffee um, with digital being a relatively new discipline Dr Dave Chaffee is kind of the guru in that area if you haven't already things like trials and things and um, just be um, aware of what you are signing up for so we want all of their motivations for the customer we want who their pay what their pain points are their behaviors how they use those platforms we want to also know how they use those different online and offline channels so usage location how often where they do it what devices what platforms and there's a really simple example here from mycustomer.com of steve he's 47 he's the ceo of a large financial company that's worth 85 million US euros he's been in that role for 10 years but he Referred to us by someone we trust so you can see there why we may be looking to do some activity on LinkedIn it comes to the website at the start of the buying journey so perhaps it uses their website as a validation and I speak to a lot of buyers from a, a small business point of view say oh we will always close the sale offline but the website sort of acts as a piece of validation to say who you say you are and you may have experienced this as a as an individual yourself perhaps you've gone to a meeting or a networking event by the time you've got back somebody's looked at you up on LinkedIn this is the digital side of things being used to underpin and to validate that you are who you say you are this is about understanding that so that meeting might still need to take place you might still need to have that lunch to do something he will use that the steve will use those digital links along the way but he buys from us for price and expertise so again we've, dig, we've dug down there to see why steve uses us he wants he's the ceo so he, he needs to save money but he also needs to know he, he's probably got a lot on his plate he's probably got a busy day he's probably digitally too, like the rest of us so what this does is he's offsetting some of that risk He's allowing us as the business to business company to do stuff for him that he's maybe not as experienced, he's maybe not as okay doing. So we need to think about who your persona is. Really importantly, we want to know what he doesn't want. And he value for money is really important. He really doesn't want to pay large fees. And this is where you can understand your customer pain points. You can understand what they're asking for. One of the things that um pure gym of tapped into with this is finding out that their pain points so their clients don't really want to have to do an induction they want to just be able to go to a city where they're having a meeting perhaps or staying overnight be able to have a workout they maybe want to um go in and just have no contract and so on because these are the pain points and if we think about uber uber with with removing those pain points of not having any cash when you go in a taxi pain points of um, splitting the fare, tipping, knowing when, you, when your driver's coming and so on. So it, this is about taking those pain points and removing those pain points as we can. So the key elements, how we put one together, this sketch should consist of who that persona is. So some biography, some of that traditional demography, what their primary and secondary goals are, think back to their problems again, think about what they're looking to achieve, where they spend their time on or offline, but be really mindful of the fact that this has changed, obviously, with everything that's happening with the pandemic. We're spending a lot of, of we've shifted in terms of devices and platforms as well. The types of content they prefer, and you'll notice that this has shifted as well. We're seeing that rise in popularity of video, depending again on your, on your, your target market, but we've seen the sort of rise of Instagram, people are, are, are happy to, to go through pictures. We've seen for the more younger demographic, we've seen the, the rise of TikTok and so on, and YouTube. So we want to know what types of content, what app types have they got? Should we be writing those two page blogs, those white pages, those downloads? You need to find that out. Also where, where they trust, so think about the trust touch points. On that last persona, we use the example of Steve who goes to somebody that he knows. I, um, when I was looking to book a flight last year, my sisters fly more frequently than me. So in addition to looking at TripAdvisor, in addition to looking at some of the comparison sites, I also, I also look to them. So we need to know who's in that decision-making unit, where are the trust touch points, how can you build that? And that can be as simple as embedding reviews on your web page, so that as you're having those doubts, 
you're mitigating those risks overall. So, no, well, 57 people say they like this and they've given it six stars. It's all the time mitigating the risk, building that trust. Think about on your website, perhaps, whether you've added the fact that you won an award, whether you are part of, whether you are a CIM chartered marketeer, for example. Again, building that level of trust. We also want to think about any pain points, so objections that they've got to use in the brands. And this is a really interesting point of view from everything that's happening with the pandemic. There's a lot of brands that may come out of this more favorably than others. And also thinking about customers, consumers, influencers. Just looking at that and thinking about trust touch points from an influencer point of view. For anybody who's in the UK, it's, it's massively kind of um, clear just how much from a financial industry point of view Martin Lewis is trusted. Quite literally, the government in the UK makes some of the um, announcements on the press uh, briefing that they do every day. And Martin Lewis is expected almost straight away to do some kind of translation around what that means. So just knowing that people use that as a trust point as part of the financials. We had a client who worked for HSBC and said when Martin Lewis does some of the announcements and does some of the screen interviews that he does, they, they experience that flurry of activity to their website. And then think about what they say. Oh, I wish I could get a taxi that he didn't have to have cash for. And then what you say back is the messages that you then send to the persona. So what it is they're trying to solve, how can you make their life better? That's then going to help your keyword and your phrases strategy. You can embed that in terms of what they're looking for. Are they looking for vegan restaurants in Liverpool? Are they looking at the moment for home cocktail delivery? That I've seen quite a lot around at the moment. What is it that they're looking for? Because you can then use that in the keywords. How you find this, just going back over some of those sources. Force website analytics, your own. So looking at those primary kind of Google analytics or if you use another analytics software package. Your own in-house social media analytics supports any kind of CRM sales and offline sales funnel information. So don't neglect to ask your salespeople. Ask what it is they're asking. We will um, often as a marketing consultancy, we will speak to clients. So some of the things they'll ask back is, yeah, but it's really expensive and you're on a retainer basis and it's going to cost me a lot of money, isn't it? And it's going to involve a lot of work. Just get that sort of ground level, what people care about. I find this really useful. The clients also come to go to their expos, their trade shows and so on, just to find what people are saying at the stores, just to find what the feeling is out there. And then, of course, all of those sources of customer feedback and staff feedback. Interviews, focus groups, surveys, of course, can help massively. So using, again, those voice of the customers and then going back to all of those secondary research sources will help you to put those customer personas. There isn't really time to go into it today, but what some organisations are also doing is anti-customer personas. And this helps them direct their efforts. This helps them to direct their resources and understand that if that particular customer is looking for maybe the cheapest and that's not how we position ourselves, that's not what we want. If that customer is looking for something that's low quality, and those anti-personas can also help us in our efforts to put our customer personas. Once we understand our customer personas, we can then start to look at our customer journeys. By looking at our customer journeys, this in turn is how we improve our customer experience. There's a really simple example. Um, those of you who've been to classes may have seen this customer journey before, but what it does is it takes three very different personas and how they look for travel. So here we've got Teresa, who's the, the blue circle. We've got Jim, who is the brace wear, and Kaylee, who's a college student. What we can see is how they go through those different stages. So at the top, we've got the likes of discovery, where you're at the awareness, you are just looking at formulating the idea that you do have that problem, where you perhaps don't know about the, the customer, sorry, about the company, and so on. Then you move to the research, conversion and post sales. What we can see really clearly, however, though, is Teresa, who's 35, is the business traveller, goes very direct in, searches for the flights. She then, boom, goes straight to look up the prices for the specific travel dates and then purchases the ticket for the flight because we understand she's using work's budget. She's not so bothered about researching different aspects of that. However, Jim comes into the process a little bit differently. He started the discovery stage learning about travel internationally. 
and then he looks up the specific travel dates before comparing rates with competitors. But as you can see towards the bottom of the screen, Jim then moves to get help on deciding on that flight. And then what we can see is Kaylee is a college student and she comes into it by watching a viral promotion video. So by looking at that and by understanding our different personas, what we can think about is at each of those stages, how we would help those customers. So we can see that Jim needs help on deciding on a flight. Perhaps he would benefit from seeing some reviews. Perhaps he would benefit at that point from some offline support. Kaylee, perhaps, we want to make sure that viral promotional video, that's where she's going to come into the process. Perhaps we can add to that by making sure that it's on Instagram, making sure that that viral promotion video is on TikTok and so on. So what we want to do is nurture. We want to slight help. We want to push our customers through that journey as gently as we can. Because what will happen if we think about the customer being in control? The customer will go elsewhere that that global consumer and there will be competitors vying for their attention. By understanding that, we can make their life better at every turn. They will also have different goals and we need to understand that. So if we think back to that last slide, at the start, the awareness is when the customer is made aware of the brand or made aware of the product or service. We need to think about, and as a consumer, I would say think about this over the next few days. Just think about how you are made aware of the business, how it sort of starts to sort of trickle into your brain really and think, is this a problem? Is this something that would make my life better? Then we go into the discovery or consideration stage and we're going to be in that a very different lengths of time depending on the context, depending on the product or service. And we're also really brilliant at reviewing the alternatives because it's easier than ever before. We don't need to take ourselves to a shop to do that and trawl around different shops. We can do this without leaving our seat essentially. Then we move to the purchase, then we use the product or service and then we're seeing the authors describe it as, even as bonding with the product. We have to bond with the product because we are very lacking in loyalty now. We don't have to look anybody in the eye to cancel our insurance anymore. We don't have to tell Amazon, sorry, we won't be with you buying that from you. We don't need to tell Morrison's that we're really sorry that this time we're ordering our shopping from Asda. So that fostering of the engagement, that building of the relationships, this is where that after the product comes in. And there's a really useful slide from Smart Insights here from 2016. It uses the race framework. So running across the top there, you'll see the reach, act, convert, engage. What it really does is it breaks it down into paid, owned and earned media, but also that green looking at customer experience. We want to make it nice. We want to make it pretty. We want to use those mediums. We want to use those platforms to, to close that loop so that we have that repeat custom. So we have that advocacy. So people are, are tagging us in their pictures. People are providing positive reviews and in turn being those brand ambassadors. And what that does is that looks at the different platforms that we can use across that graph at the reach, the act, the convert um, and engage stage. So you will find that on Smart Insights and what I would suggest is you just take a look at that because I find that I find that really useful in terms of not sort of overkill with the channels but making sure we use as we can. So from a customer experience point of view, something that I also wanted to mention was mobile versus desktop. If you take a look at your own Google Analytics and if we take a look at those secondary reports, you will probably your site is increasing and is increasing in is increasing continuously. Um, so we need to think, however, about not just kind of going gung ho into, into mobile. We know with regards to Google algorithm, we know the rollout that meant that we would be penalized. We know all of the advice on being mobile optimized. And there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of guides that you can find on that. But I want to talk today about how we use mobile within the customer experience. And mobile is used in acquisition, retention, and brand building. However, there's something that's massively important about mobile, it's contextual. As I said to you before, can you get through that film without going on your mobile? Just a bit, a bit more willy nilly when it comes to your mobile on its today. More and more, it's based on location also, and this is where Google is enabling those more and more 
Peter's near me searches, thinking about the needs of the individual. Think about you've picked up your phone and started that search before you've even thought about it. And we need to think as organisations, as market players, what is therefore applicable to us. Now, thus far, the mobile search and mobile activity is used more for the upper funnel activities. And what we mean by the upper funnel activities is more of the awareness. I still do this as a consumer and I will often not convert on my mobile. I'll often use it for the browsing, the research and the comparing alternatives. But I want to see that widened out screen when it comes to um, actually purchasing the product. We'll use it for sharing information, we'll use it for sending on to our friends and we'll also use it for browsing. Desktop visits sort of show this trend as they tend to last three times longer than mobile visits. You have to think about this idea that we're very kind of, meh, when we're on our mobile, we're not committed. So we want to think about how we can follow that customer throughout their journey. So they're using that mobile, but then we use the desktop to perhaps engage, complete the transactions. We're using our mobiles more personal time, whereas desktop tends to dominate work hours. Again, just be aware of the fact that that has shifted of late, of course, with everything that is happening with the pandemic. There's that blurred line now really with our personal and our work time. And again, slightly probably different now but mobile tends to be the highest during the early evening and during commuting times thinking about ebay when they say their busiest time is a sunday evening we do have a lower attention span when we're using our mobile devices than perhaps when we're more directed and using our desktops but just this idea of dual and second screening so thinking about the customer journey we've really got to be aware of dual or second screen i would even say in some cases triple and four screening particularly with younger people i see my son seamlessly go through lots of different devices and still be able to hold a conversation and watch tv so that idea that we are sort of the attention span again and that we'll see this with regards to next for example next will advertise their sale online knowing specifically that people will have their tablet and people will have their mobile phone and they'll will go, will go straight to that from watching the TV because a lot of the time we do and we are second screening. So thinking, thinking again, really importantly about integration. How can you potentially work with your customers to capture them when they're second screening? We've got to make sure that we reach customers at any time and any place and Go back to last, going back to last week's webinar, we did a lot on location-based marketing, but we did a lot on citation building and how you can increase your presence on directories. If you make sure that your name, your address and phone number is consistent and is included on a lot of local directories, this will help your Google efforts. This will help your organic search engine ranking. We want to make sure we pop up when and where it's needed. We've got to think about a user experience. How, where, why do your customers access your site? So when we're looking at design for mobile and a lot of those points and those vantage points across the journey will be on mobile. We want to look at you, those usage passive, passive, sorry, I can't speak, usage patterns and orientation. What is it being used for? We've got to think about a smaller screen size and we've got to think about click versus touch that I'll go on to in a second. I want you to just imagine yourself as a consumer for just a second now and how you get annoyed if you're anything like me. When you start to try and do something on a mobile that won't let you do, that won't let you fill in forms and so on and how you just, you just sort of leave it. Won't let you add your card details, you can't go back, it won't let you remove forms and so on. Think about that level of commitment that you've got, it's only half and half. You, you tend to also be watching the TV or having a conversation or on a bus or doing something else. So we've got to make it as easy as we possibly can or that conversion will be lost. And that we can break it down using an author called Clark quite a while ago now that spoke about the idea that when we're using mobiles, it can break down into microtasking, local search, and when we're just bored. And there's a lot of this going on at the moment, obviously. But this this microtasking is when the user interacts with their device for sort of frenzied period of activity. We use it for local whether we're trying to find our way around when we're in a different city, trying to find a restaurant, trying to find takeaway food, trying to find a car park, a hotel, and so on. And then of course when we're bored, this is what I was trying to say about I tried to counteract. 
went um, and I try and concentrate on one thing rather than just going on your mobile. So we need to understand it's more task orientated than a desktop. And what I found a lot of companies have had really good success with is working out what are the tasks that can be completed. So even if you break it down for your journey, for your customer, for your persona, what can they do? What micro conversion, what task can they complete on the mobile? Context, as we've said, is increasingly important and that overlaps into location and it's really essential to move the buyer through the journey simply and quickly. They're being distracted, they're being taken away all of the time. It goes without saying, and this is true for all of your platforms, that the website must load as quickly as possible. Again, just think about how we behave when it's, it's loading really slowly. And structures should be flatter. So when we, what we mean by that is the way that your pages are structured, the way that your categories, the way that your menus, your submenus, and as simple as possible. Again, that will allow your customers to move through the journey as quick as they possibly can. So there's just some good examples that I wanted to use here. Just think about Amazon. Think about the last time you accessed Amazon on a desktop. Whereas Amazon here use a really um, successful smaller screen size. What they will do is, you know, the search bar is really accessible at the top. But they'll also, they'll also make a smaller category list for you so that you're not overwhelmed and you then maybe can't find your own account, can't find your one click settings. So they will take that based on you, based on personalization and give you the categories that you're most likely to order from to give you that real sort of smaller screen size to really understand that you've got to understand the resolution so your google analytics not so just think about that think about the browsers that they're using think if there's been any shift in the sharing for that and prioritize what they're looking for at the moment we've seen customers we, we've seen sorry we've seen the grocery shoppers at the moment tra trying to sort of organize the deliveries trying to organize um, during the pandemic trying to prioritize vulnerable people the majority of websites now, if you go on straight away, will have advice around COVID because they're either their customers or their products or their services or their delivery or services are affected by that. So we need to understand that COVID is obviously at the forefront of everyone's minds, but usually speaking, there will be things that shift. And this goes back to understanding our customers, who they are, how they're changing. When I was doing some website work for a restaurant a while ago, we realized very quickly that we need to put the vegan menu more prominently because that's what people were looking for. People care about different things and that shift. They want to find what they're looking for. They want to find, can it be delivered today? I'll often go on websites and be really annoyed that it, it, it won't give you the category of something that can be delivered today or, or delivered tomorrow. Not that I make a habit of forgetting people's birthday, but I have been known to. So, we want to make sure that we create the minimum amount of input for to achieve the conversion. So quick checkout, quick payment options, anything that stops us doing, yeah, yeah, I'll just leave that. We don't want to do any horizontal horizontal scrolling. We want to only be able to do vert vertical scrolling. It comes absolutely natural to us to vertically scroll on a phone, and you'll find that if you have to do anything different, you won't know what to do. We've got to lead our customers. We've got to understand what they expect. So from a click versus tap, we also need to think about this idea of how we behave with a mouse versus how we behave with touch on a phone. Now I watch my son, whatever device he's using, try to touch it because obviously he's only eight years old and he, the majority of the devices he's known are touch screen. So we need to think about how we behave and how we understand how customers see, locate and act. How many times have you found yourself on your phone trying to find something, being annoyed that it isn't where you expect it to be? From a user design point of view, from a user experience also, we go into websites now and we'll be looking straight away for the phone number in the top right hand side. We'll, we'll be looking for the menu across the top. We'll expect to find jobs, career opportunities in the about us section and the certain things that have just come to be what we expect. Our behavior on mobile is just the same. The way that we think about this from a tap and click point of view, is there any auto data that can be filled in? You know that lovely feeling that you get when you think, oh, my name and address is already in there. It's already asking me, do I wanna use this same credit card? Anything that's clunky, get rid of. Address lookups, 
We want clear error messages. Have you ever found yourself in a mobile and you can't remove the form, you can't take it out and you don't know what to do? Have you ever found yourself in a mobile where you're trying to purchase something and you can't find the move forward for purchase or you can't find your checkout or you can't find in the top right hand corner, corner that there's a basket and so on? Every area that you can click on, you should consider. Undo messages are really, really useful features and they'll guide customers. They'll stop you going, oh, I'm going to come out. And also think that touch keyboards are much more prone to errors. So we want to ask for as little information as we possibly can. Don't ask for unnecessary information if the shortcuts take advantage of it. So just want to say a quick few um, words about personalization before we close for the day. So customer experience, we're going to find more and more that customers are expecting and demanding personalization. I've even seen some social media posts where people are grumbling that they're not being targeted with offers that are very relevant to them. But I just need to sort of add a caveat to that, that we are doing that and seeing that need for offers that are relevant and customers who want us to have all of their detail and their preferences against that backdrop of increasing concern for privacy, for security. We've, yes, the GDPR has become legislation, but we're yet to see a lot of um, case law. We're yet to see a lot of cases that have gone through the court. So we need to really be mindful of that. But if we can be personalized with our customers, it does deliver five to eight times the return on investment in terms of our marketing spend. And the customer builds that bond with us. They feel that connection. They feel that engagement. They're more likely to re um, recommend us, more likely to be that brand advocate. However, I mentioned this before. We feel a little bit overwhelmed as marketeers. We've got so much data that comes our way. We've got a lot of different integrated systems working that we have to go into. They're giving us different reports. And it's 69% according to this survey feel like it's distracting them from their core market duties. Work out what you can do. Work out what you can do in terms of resources. If you imagine Tesco using personalized marketing, they will be using really high powered integrated software. You may have 12 customers and it might be that you're already doing personalization. It might be that you already send a case of wine to your key customers because you know they like that, you know they'll keep coming back for more. Not that I'm recommending they try and bribe your customers with alcohol, by the way, but it might, it, is, it can be simple as that, that you know you don't contact John Smith, the customer, because he goes away during August and so on. It might be as small or as large as something like Tesco, but personalization we need to think about from a customer experience point of view even more than ever before. We also need to move towards something called a CDP. This is just a customer database platform that is accessible to other systems. You will find a lot of writing about this. You'll find a lot of the academics, you'll find a lot of the journals and a lot of the trade press. This taps into this idea, sorry for any noises that it's picking up from outside, there's children playing outside even though I've got the windows um, closed. But the idea of us as marketeers being overwhelmed with the amount of data but also having to run on a number of different systems perhaps systems that have been inherited perhaps systems that have been bought at different points what we need to do in order to be able to unify the customer experience in, in order to be able to personalize the customer experience is figure out a system again based on the resources that we have got that pulls all of this together so we are thinking about all of those data from multiple sources. We're thinking about gathering that touch point data. So going back to that idea of the customer journey, all of that idea of journey mapping, the device, the platforms that we're using. And then how do we then in turn profile? How do we segment our customers? How do we add to that persona? So this can be as simple as a marketing information system that will then ultimately lead towards integrated software, potentially hardware. How do we match our data? How do we profile for marketing campaigns? This is something that you do need to build in capacity for going forward. Is it something that's gonna be even more important? And also predictive analytics. How do we look to see when demand is likely to increase, when we like to see those fluctuations and reductions? It's really, really critically 
how do we then feed that inflation back? So how do we close that loop so it's at the top of our marketing plan and that it's informing what we do in the future, how it's allowing us to optimize, how it's allowing us to test and to keep on getting better. We need to consider this as some way of planning for the future. So when we're looking to, in, when we're looking to plan resources, whether they be physical, human, always thinking about systems. And if there's something that I get as a recurring theme, it's that um, clients are working on really archaic systems. I've seen some really successful large turn and over companies working on spreadsheets and so on. So provisions for systems is something that is key if you were going to deliver excellence in customer experience. So just some other points in terms of value driven experiences. And I think this is key now. I think there's been a little bit of a shift in people's motivations and perceptions given the lockdown, given what's happened in the world. But already there was a survey in 2018 that said 78% of millennials would rather spend money on a memorable experience or event than buy desirable things. So we need to think about the experience. And some research that we did for a university a while ago showed this, that um, it's all about the university experience rather than the product itself. So we need to think about this from our own augmented product position, our own layered product. How do we add delight? How do we, how, how do we inject joy throughout that journey, depending on what our product and services is? And this leads us into this idea of content that resonates. It's content that resonates at the time. And again, there's a massive amount of content going around at the moment, very much around the world, around wildlife, around people coming together and so on. Don't underestimate the idea that people will make their own fun. So this idea of interactivity, you can't stop people talking to each other. They're out there, they're on the platforms, they're connected to each other. They're very clever at making memes. They're very clever at taking your information and using it for different messages and so on. So people will interact with your brand and make their own fun. Be prepared for that, be there to moderate that. Be prepared, to, be prepared to kind of roll with that if that is something that's timely and resonates with people. Customization leads us into personalization. It is all about relevance. Customer experience is all about site design. We would probably need another 10 sessions to go through customer experience site design. UX is one of those massively growing areas in marketing. Again, if reading if time is on your side there's a lot of additional reading on excellence in, in ux there's a lot of case studies there's a lot of examples also don't underestimate the idea of order fulfillment as customers we expect as a bare minimum excellence in order fulfillment the, there is a lot of writing every christmas that those who get the order fulfillment and those who inject excellence into delivery are those who win out quite literally you get a text to let you know who's coming, what van they're going to be in, what their name is, whether they've got a pet cat, and so on. It seems to enrage people if there's not excellence with order fulfillment. So if you do deliver any kind of physical, do deliver any kind of service, just think about the way that your order is fulfilled. Likewise, people expect supplementary services around this. Um, a friend bought a um, quite a modern um, high technology flat screen TV and was really annoyed that I couldn't find a specific YouTube video just expected as a given that there'd be a YouTube video around not only installing that TV but integrating it with various samples and various other products that he's already got installed in his house so think about how you can supplement even if it's not your core product even if it's just that they're coming to check into your hotel do you make the process of them finding somewhere to park as easy as possible have you, have you sent them the weather update the day before and so on and this idea of communities and engagements again more important than ever before when you're building that customer experience when you're building those relationships and fostering that engagement long term can you give them those platforms can you give them those online communities is there cohesive hashtags you can use can they use your faqs can you give them a forum that they could potentially answer each other's questions, support each other. If anybody's in kind of public services, we know that this is um, something that is really important. Do you work closely with the charities and so on? So it's not gonna happen on its own, excellent customer experience. So we need to just, I wanna leave you with a couple of things here. We need to think about the tools and technology. Can't do it, sadly, on a shoestring. 
but I, I really understand you're all restricted in terms of the resources that you've got from skills point of view, from a staffing point of view. Sometimes I find with systems, it's hard in the sort of hamster on a wheel situation that you're in. It's hard to stop and actually look at other things and maybe look at other systems to so just carry on doing what you're doing, even if, it, it, even if there is uh, solutions out there that would take a lot of time. Um, or that would save a lot of time. So we want to look at those tools and technologies. We want to look at the skills and resources and we want to build those for the future. It's only going to get quicker. It's only going to get more um, competitive. You are competing with the world. We need to measure what we're doing. So from a customer experience, please don't think we're doing everything brilliantly and don't measure. We've got to measure all of the time. Better never stops. We've got to optimise. We've got to test. We don't know what we don't know. Keep remembering that they're a moving target. And we've got to do this with agility. So those companies I find who've got cultures that are better at failing fast, better at dusting themselves down and keeping going. Okay, that didn't work. We're going to try this. So we want to make sure that we do that. And then we've got to put in provision for integrating that. What we don't want is the customer experience digitally being something that is standalone. Your customers don't see it like that. Your customers are looking at Domino's as the stores, as the, as the pizza that's on the app, on their phone as the leaflet that's come through the door, as the text message that they've got. They want to access all of that on their website. They don't see the digital as something that is completely separate. So integrate everything from the offline to the online. They won't want to jump through hoops and they won't do that for you. So just to give you some information on the Oxford College of Marketing, if anybody did want any further information, we've got 20 years in delivering marketing courses, digital marketing sales and project management courses, from qualifications all the way through to shorter courses. And um, we've got over 2,000 students every year. We're really proud of our 95 passions. And we've got 19 global study centers as a result of that growth with an extensive online learning platform. So there's a massive amount of resources. There's a massive amount of opportunities for learning. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, any comments that you've got now. I just wanted to go through customer experience um, today as a just a, as a sort of introduction there is a lot of there is a lot of resources and i'll add them to the slides if you did want to do any additional reading obviously with these lockdown and lunch events we are touching on some of the areas and some of the areas would lend themselves to full sessions so i am um, just remains to say thanks for listening in thanks for checking in today and the recording will be available on the lockdown and lunch um, page which is at the start of the slides. Happy to take any questions at all now. Any any questions, any comments at all? Any even any kind of examples of success or sort of learning experiences you've had from customers? Hi Sue. Hello. Hello hello in Romania. <laughs> hello. So nice hello. to see you again. I just wanted to ask hello. you I think is that the link or is on what people do use? I'm really sorry. Such I don't know. Way the, the I'm really sorry, but you dropped off then. Don't know if you dropped off for others. Did that question, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I was wondering what the explanation users to prefer uh, scrolling vertically, not horizontally. Sorry, you mentioned in the, in the presentation that. Oh, okay. Yeah, quite, quite simple. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Now, yes. You can hear me now. Are you able to hear me now? Dropping in and out, I'm afraid. Is the connection a little bit unstable for everybody else? It's no. I 
think your connection's slightly unstable. I don't know. I, I do still have your email, so I will send you an email after this session. Sure, sure, perfect. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. I'll, I do have your email, so and if not, I will speak to Oana and grab your email and send you an email. Is that okay? Is there any further questions at all? Any further comments? Hey, so can you hear me? I can. Yes. Um, not so much a question, but just um, interesting thoughts off of all of this. Um, just looking at Domino's Pizza, you used as an example, when you think about the um, second screening and the direct mail and the app on the phone and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Instantly, to my mind, I think it's all that omni-channel marketing experience, isn't it? Absolutely. It's that consistency. Yeah. Yeah. And now I want pizza. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> a couple yeah, of no, all, I'm, all I'm seeing now in my mind's eye is bubble and cheese mm. because I, I literally someone will send you a text which is the Domino's will send you a text to tell you there's an offer that will lead you to the website that will then some you know you will then pick up your tablet to order that you'll then mm. get a leaflet with another offer and they're really clever at being able to use that sort of entire integrated experience. Yeah, certainly. And Domino's were one of the first to bring in the um, app purchasing of fast food. Yeah. Um, they really were ahead of the game on that one. Another thing that I picked up on, you mentioned trust, which in, in my world, because I'm very much B2B, that, that is really important. And just yesterday, I was having a chat to um, uh, a reporter, actually, because last year, Ironically, I was doing a lot of exports to China. Okay. So the Chinese consumers are not so much concerned about the, the price, but they're more concerned about that trust and that relationship and buying from people that they feel that they can connect with. So there's, there's all sorts of different patterns going on there, isn't there? Yeah. And when I look at my suppliers, certainly um, stand builders for any C exhibitions and printers, well, these are friends that I've known for like 10 years. So, so I found that interesting. Yeah, the, the, it's that idea as well that you'll sort of, you'll go on a website, you'll meet somebody or you'll go on a website and they just a, a brand of logos along the bottom. And you don't know what a lot of those mean. I'll, I'll often say to people outside of the industry or oh, I'm a chartered marketeer and they go, ooh. And I say, do you know what that means? No. Mm. It's just, but they're all ways that you're just mitigating the risk. They're like it's sort of if you know you get a price from an electrician and the electrician's got the logos and the same mm. marks. We're always when we're kind of making any sort of purchase or considering any purchase, we're, or, there's always a risk. Yeah. So any way that we can possibly mitigate that risk. Yeah, totally. And a, a last little comment from me because again in this B two B world, when you talk about mitigating risk, obviously we've got things like ISO accreditation and rail industry type accreditation. And it's all about mitigating that risk yeah. for the customer. And it got me on to think about, I write a lot of tender proposals. Well, of course, that in itself is marketing communications, isn't it? Um, and it got me to thinking, back in 2015, I was writing a tender for an insurance company, because that's what I was in then. And at the time, we were doing flood restoration, and there were floods going on up in Appleby uh, Lake District. And we were up there cleaning it all up and doing what we do as I was writing this tender. Interestingly, the issue I had at the time was that the social media team were putting out things completely meaningless and irrelevant and fun, but not actually putting out the message at the time that these people were reading the tender that we are on site doing it now. So it's all about, I think the marketing teams is to get that unification, isn't it? And get that consistency. Yeah, but I think where the challenges then come in slightly is that it, it's difficult because you're you're writing those tenders and you're working on that so mm. how can you do that you can't do it all so ideally mm. only you would be you or you, the colleagues who are working on that would be doing the social media because there's that disconnect and you get a bit of that sometimes if an agency does social media mm. it's about figuring out a system but and that system looks very different for every single organization that that they're not just that they're not just like, as you say, just posting out those dry messages that have nothing to do with what, you, you know, what you're doing at the time. And mm. I think that this is why I often mention throughout resources, because it's about understanding that 
you know, you, you can't do all of that, but you also need to not just open all of those doors and not be able to manage them effectively. Mm. Yeah, that's no, brilliant. So I'm going to mute myself for you, but thanks, Lee. That was really good as always. So, uh, thank you. I'm glad thank you found it useful. Always. Thank you. thank you. Is there any further questions at all? Any further comments? So it doesn't seem to be any further comments. Thank you all for listening in today. Um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and um, and the recording will be available um, within 24 to 48 hours for you to access and the next, I hope that you all access the next session and speak to you all soon.